Hi, everybody. This is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. Apparently, I'm wearing the same shirt that I always wear, according to Christina. Um, really glad to have Christina with me today. Christina McBurry is the principal of Sarah Pyle Academy in Wilmington, Delaware. We're just going to dive right in. Christina, tell us a little bit about your school, what kind of learning you're trying to make happen there before the pandemic, your student okay. community. I would love to, and thanks for having me. And I did say it was it's a similar shirt, Scott, and I like it. It shows that I watch and I see. Thank you. <laughs> and I love the room, too, with all the books. So Sarah Pyle Academy is an awesome school. I mean, every day you can go to the spa is pretty phenomenal. And that's what we call it. So when uh, I first started going there, the kids were like, wow, you go to the spa a lot. But um, it was, uh, it's in in a school district. So it services all the um, high schools and by choice, uh, many schools in the Newcastle County uh, area in Wilmington. Um, it was originally designed to be a dropout prevention program, which it still is. However, it has evolved into a school that attracts students who have um, anxiety, um, other mental health challenges, um, our teen parents, um, are entrepreneurs or pretty much anybody who a traditional seven and a half hour a day, five day a week school just doesn't work for them or where they just have not found success. So it's pretty awesome. Um, our students have four hours academic, four hours non-academic, um, and our overall instructional purpose is together inspiring lifelong success through um, personalization, which about five years ago we figured out is not just always instruction and especially our clientele of students that we really need to focus on the heart uh, and overall well-being and mental healthiness and physical healthiness so as the pandemic started we were well on our way to make sure that our kids had what they needed so what does that look like as you had to shift to remote learning so you have a very particular learning modality there right yeah, so it's blended and it's always been blended. So some kids are working completely on the computer. Some are working half and half, quarter, quarter, you know, whatever. It's completely and highly personalized. So when the shift happened, there's two words that come to mind. Comfort, because this was very much what we were doing already, and panic. <laughs> I mean, there's just, there was no other place in the continuum where we really were. And um, there we didn't miss a step. Students were able to continue their instruction at about 95% of the time because we had established organically starting about seven years ago to the point where we are now a personalized learning portal where all students get their own account um, through Google Apps for Education. Parents get an account. All of our teachers are Google certified and we rely heavily on that. So students collaboratively with their uh, teachers, whether it, it was already face-to-face -face or remote, were setting their goals, identifying their strengths and their needs, and leveraging that to make goals towards graduation. So some of our kids may have had a goal to graduate this June, some this April, some this August already. So they knew what they had needed to do in terms of coursework to get there. So we knew that was okay. Um, so when we, like other folks, didn't know that we were gonna be out as long as we were, or even when that decision was gonna be made by the governor, so it kind of was surprised, but at the same time we knew, and our kids knew how to access us, our parents knew, we, that's how we communicate. The panic came in when we realized that as much as we all would like to think that everybody has what they need, the reality just really isn't there. Our kids had the ability to take devices home, but all of them didn't take devices home. A lot of our kids, even if they had devices, they didn't have access to internet. You know, I think as we move forward, one of the things we need are devices that have internet with them you know, instead of hot spots. So that was a panic. Um, and then, you know, overall, um, as that whole thing changed as well, one of the things that we didn't have to worry about that my staff didn't need to be trained because they already knew all the platforms, they already knew how to connect. Um, and then I think a little bit more panic to where the kids will, that you can't engage and you can't touch and see and see where they were. So, Christina, you're serving a student clientele, like you said, that's a little different. Mm -hmm. um, and it strikes me that some of the students that you're serving, maybe many, many or most, uh, are the exact same students that other districts are really struggling with right now. Agreed. So, yeah. 
what lessons do you have for them about particularly around social emotional learning and sort of you know whole child education and you know taking care of vulnerable and yet also resilient youth right <laughs> yeah. yeah so that's such a great question i think that there are, the lessons start the moment a kid walks in the door i've been saying for years so i've been in education for 23 24 years it was a turnaround a specialist and you know, went in was all, I'm still very data driven, but in a totally different way right now. Um, and we all know relationships. We all say it's relationships, 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 but it really is relationships. And I think we're in such a unique position right now to redefine education and to really establish what's going to work for all kids and what's going to work for all kids is looking at each kid individually and so when a kid comes in whether it's a central district office or whatever and we identify what's the best placement for them and so it's not just a geographic location you go into school so currently at my district that's what happens you know they go in in most districts you go to your high school based on your your area or you get to choice or you get to apply and wait for a lottery um and and that has so much to do with so many other things other than what's really best for the kid. And so we see so many kids, our kids are unable to come to us until they're 16, which we've gone back and forth many, many times about. And it's really a maturity level, but if we had a different program, we would be able to service many more kids even younger in the way, like there's no bells. The kids need to be motivated, you know, they're personalized in, in so many ways, but we're missing so many kids in that. So in terms of the lesson learned, kids with high anxiety, for example, they cannot function. You can't tell that they can't function. You know, they're highly intelligent, but they are suffering so much, but they're the kids who stop attending. They're the kids that, you know, suffer in so many other ways. So if we were able to identify ahead of time, when, when kids are going from eighth grade to ninth grade, what they need and then put them in those programs. And then in terms of social, um, social and emotional learning, you know, the relationship, our kids trust us. And it takes a while to get there because they, they see and they believe. But when the kids know that you are concerned about their overall well-being first, everything else happens. And it takes a while to get there and to really earn that trust. Right. So what have you been doing to check in with kids and families? Oh, everything. I don't even know what we haven't been doing. So Again, because of our portal, uh, you know, when we're making connections, a lot of times we're not talking about school. It's just, we want to say hi. You know, I have this one teacher who just sends out like ridiculous funny things like, you know, every day, like I, I, I had tea and peanut butter and jelly today. What did you have to eat? Um, we still have issues with attendance with our kids, like everybody else um, and our advisory, but our kids still attend our advisory, which is a homeroom, which loops. And these teachers have such a great relationship and with our students. And from the first day a kid walks into the spa, we emphasize that everybody has to have one person. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's our bus, or your bus driver, your cafeteria, our cafeteria manager, Miss Carrie. I don't care if it's me. I don't care who it is. And I'm going to ask you who that is and we're going to follow up. So right now we have our cafeteria, Miss Carrie reaches out to people. We have um, other folks that are reaching out to the kids to connect and make sure that they're there. And, and if they have the capacity, because a lot of my kids are working too, which I mean, in some ways is good, but especially, you know, a couple of weeks ago was very, very worrisome. They can't do that, take care of their brothers and sisters or take care of their parents and take care of other things. And sometimes school needs to be put on pause and just making that connection and engagement will hold them through to when school can come back on again. And that holds them enough time where we're not worried about seat time. There's so many states that still seat time regulation. <laughs> Hopefully this is gone from now, from here on out, seat time is forever and ever a goodbye thing, you know? Absolutely. So what are a couple of leadership decisions that you and your team made that you thought worked really well? So for one, it was making sure that we were connecting and checking in with our kids and that as much as we wanted them to get work done and we knew that that's what they needed, that we were checking in on their hearts and being true to what it is we do. Um, some other leadership decisions was continuing to lead by values. You know, I say family first, I mean family first. A lot of my teachers were in a place where they felt like, and it's funny, and I say this, but they thought like, oh no, I'm gonna have to take days off. But they were still putting in eight, nine hours a day, but it wasn't in the constraints of, 
you know, eight to four, and they felt really, really guilty, or their kids were in and out of their frames. It's okay. Kids are going to be, I'm surprised that no dog or human has been in our frame right now while we're talking. And giving them grace and the ability to be like, this is still us. It is okay. Um, or if they have to miss a meeting. Um, and then following through with that, like we did staff happy hours where it was just us talking and doing, um, uh, guac, I'm trying to remember the app that we use um, all the time now, but we, we ended up having to switch anyway and go back to Zoom because it didn't hold enough people. But we were just having fun doing trivia together and checking in on them and making sure that they are okay. Um, and then I guess in terms of our students as well is, you know, as much as we were personalized, really making sure that we were doing whatever it takes to engage those students, dropping off devices, checking in, um, what at whatever, if we needed to lift a kid somewhere, you know, teachers were like, is it okay? I'm um, giving a student, um, sending a student a lift so they could get to this doctor's appointment. And I'm like, yeah, we'll find a way to reimburse you. But that's the kind of stuff that um, you can't teach somebody and you also can't expect. It just has to come from the heart and come, come in inherently. Got it. So you've got three, three and a half weeks left. I can talk year. for hours more. <laughs> no, it's all good. So you've got three, three and a half <laughs> yeah. in the school year, uh, and then you've got summer considerations or challenges as you move forward here. So um, considerations and challenges is keeping students engaged and helping them continue to move forward. I mean, there's some students where we just, like I said earlier in the conversation, that we have to recognize that school, just like before, is a challenge, and we're going to have to be okay with that. But I need to keep touching in and making sure they have what they need, making sure they know where they can get food. Mental health challenges for us has been one of the most biggest concerns. And luckily we had tons of training um, in mental health first aid um, and NAMI doing many other workshops with our school. So just reminding them of the resources and making sure they're connected with the resources because I'm, I'm gravely concerned about everyone's mental health as this continues and, and what we don't know. Um, so just this weekend, we went and visited all of our seniors and dropped off stuff and got to see them face to face, you know, from a distance. Um, and I think that that relieved the distress of a lot of our staff because we, we didn't know. I mean, it's fine to see somebody over face to face, but it's different to be in their presence. Um, so that's going to be a challenge um, and, you know, and continuing. But I think that there are so many uh, considerations moving forward. I'm really for worried about the slip back not just with us, but with the rest of the um, nation, we can't go back to business as usual. This is such an awesome opportunity for us to really rewrite our wrongs, or at least not rewrite our wrongs that everything was wrong in education, because it was not. But to fix the things that we were not changing because it was almost too difficult, because it, and it was easier, it was the path of least resistant to continue, like month school within the months that it was, or you know otherwise, um, I had the awesome opportunity to be a part of a project through um, pushing push boundaries consulting, and um, we did a free book. It was sixteen experts, fifteen because I don't consider myself an expert, so <laughs> there were fifteen plus me, um, and so we wrote, wrote this free book called um, Recovery um, Recovery Mode. And then we're doing Twitter chats and everything and all these brilliant people talking about how now we can rewrite and leverage student voice and recognize the importance of the connected world. And my chapter is all about, you know, mental health and trauma and how we can really infuse that into our programming and leverage that in a way to be thoughtful and mindful, but more importantly, make that our focus as we move forward and instead of standardized tests and, and our accountability. So I think my biggest challenge and my biggest fear is that we don't use this as an opportunity to really move forward in the way that we can. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we've got some opportunities to evolve here. Hopefully most districts will uh, take those up. Yeah, and I can, we can hope, but more importantly, we can also take action right now too. So I know I plan and I know you do too. Yeah, absolutely. Christina, anything else you wanna share here at the end? Um, no, what, what a great opportunity to get people from across the world. And again, the importance of working together. If this has done nothing else, that we need to work together in a connected world um, and to leverage our uh, shared brilliance, our shared experiences. You know, the, these chronicles are really, really a um, first step or a second step in being able to do that. Because if we do that, we're really going to be able to redefine education in a way that's helpful for our grandkids. 
Oh, thanks, Christina, for the kind words. Um, everybody, that's Christina McMurray, principal of Sarah Pyle Academy in Wilmington, Delaware. We'll make sure you get all the links for recovery mode, which you just mentioned. And yeah, just, that'd be awesome. Christina, thanks for your time today. Thanks so much, Scott.